Well, next up, we are very privileged to have uh, Louis, who is the man behind Pentester Lab, a uh, bit of an icon in Australia and around the world. Uh, and his talk is on JWAT attacking JSON web tokens. So let's give Louis a welcome uh, uh, reception. Hey, can people hear me in the back? Yeah, okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Louis, and I'm going to talk about JWT. Uh, this is my SoundCloud. Uh, so last time I did that talk at, in New Zealand, an older version of that talk, I messed up the first demo, and my laptop freezed in the middle of the talk. So I'm hoping to do a bit better today. And so my, this is about myself. I'm a security engineer, do pen test, code review, a uh, security architect, a bit of everything. Yanak, so I'm not a cryptographer, not at all. Like, I tried to read the Swiss Post paper this morning in the plane, and <laughs> yeah. Um, and I run this website named Pentester Lab. I basically teach people web hacking. And when you teach, web people, when you teach people web hacking, you want good examples. And JWT are amazing for that if you want to teach people applied crypto. Because again, I'm not a cryptographer. I really enjoy applied crypto. And on the left corner, you can see my probably like biggest achievement in life. I made the Silvio stickers. <laughs> right? Uh, I got some if you want. <laughs> He's losing it. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, uh, Pentester Lab also has like a free, a lot of free content. So check it out. So who is using JWT? So Every day, when you're browsing the web, you're probably using JWT, and you don't know about it, because everything is going like through cookies or for HTTP header or parameters. And people use it a lot if they're using OAuth or for sessions, or as well to manage trust. I want to sign something and send it to someone and make sure that no one tampered with it. I'm using JWT, and mostly because as well they're cool, so everyone wants to use something cool. Uh, people using it as well if they want to be stateless, so they don't want to have a pool of session across multiple systems or a pool of session across multiple data centers. So they're using signed session slash JWT to do this. So they don't have to like, share uh, something like via NFS or just one database or something ugly like that. All right, I should use this thing. So some acronyms. So JOSE for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption. That's the group who is working on putting together all the RFC to say, like, oh, that's how the token should be, that's how things should work, blah, blah, blah. Um, JOT token, that's what people call them, JWT or JOT. Uh, JSON encryption, JSON web encryption, JWE, is something I'm not going to talk about, but also like a lot of interesting thing to look at. And today, I'm going to spend my time on JSON web signatures, so JWS. So basically, just sign token. We're going to talk as well about JWK. So it's just a way to represent a key. So it's just like JSON version of a public key or private key, whatever you want to put it. And JWA are the algorithm that you can use for JWS or JWE. So Crypto 101. So encryption gives you confidentiality. Signature gives you integrity. And people get confused with both. They think like, OK, if I encrypt something, people cannot see this information, so not, they cannot tamper with it. It's actually not true. You can modify the data without knowing what's inside and get other results. So when you're signing things, what you want, what, when you want integrity, what you do is you sign. So multiple ways of signing. The most common way, if you, for example, play with payment gateway, is using HMAC. So it's basically a construction around a hash, like MD5. And it's a hash of a hash, so you avoid uh, attacks like length extension. And another way is to use asymmetric crypto with public private key. So this way, not everyone has a secret. So if you're using a secret with HMAC, the person signing or the system signing needs to have the key, because they're signing, right? But the person getting the message and verifying the message need also to have the secret, because otherwise they can't compute the same HMAC and they can't tell, OK, that's the same thing. 
If you use seeing asymmetric crypto, the person signing just needs a private key. They also get the public key for free, but they get the, they get the private key and they sign. On the receiving end, the person verifying or the system verifying the, C, the signature only needs the public key. So if you have done a bit of security before, that sounds like a lot better, right? Anyway, so the JWT format. So the good thing with JWT and probably why people like it a lot, it is very, very simple, or it looks very, very simple. So first, a bit of JSON. So you're probably familiar with JSON. You got like, OK, uh, this is like a string. This is like my first name, my last name. You can have arrays. You can have a hash. And you can put whatever you want inside it. I was really inspired when I put that slide together, as you can probably tell. That's actually Silvio's address. <laughs> no. Uh, so then you got three parts. So that's why it's really easy. The header, the payload, and the signature. And the signature is here to make sure you didn't tamper with the payload and the header. They separated by a dot. So this way it's easy when you receive a token to split it. You don't have like, OK, I need like five bytes, then five bytes. You just like split on the dots. And it's basically Base64 encoded JSON. So Base64, kind of, it's URL safe Base64 encoding without padding which is very similar to Base64, but you will see it there are some little details. And the signature is also Base64 encoded, but it's not JSON. So that's why your token kind of looks like AYJ, blah, 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 dot AYJ, blah, 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 dot blah, signature. So because it's the Base64 of a curly bracket, an opening curly bracket with a double quote, that gives you AYJ. So Really easy to spot on the wire, right? You see like AYJ data, a dot, AYJ data, a dot. It's most likely a JWT. So I was talking about Base64, URL safe encoding without padding. The thing is that people use JWT for web stuff a lot. And if you do web, you know, and you do like some JWT or uh, web parkour, you know that's some characters really break payloads, like a plus, because a plus is a space encoded, right? And a slash also can break like a path, for example, because that's the way you delimit paths in a file system. So JWT URL safe, uh, base 64 URL safe encoding without padding, get rid of all these characters that may mess up your uh, JWT. And they also remove the equals for the same reason, because that's the way to split between a name and a value when you have like HTTP parameters. If you want to have fun, you can read the RFC at the bottom. So the header contains the algorithm attribute. So that's going to tell the person verifying the token, this is how you need to verify my token. And here, for example, we're using HS256 to say it's HMAC with SHA256. It also contains a type here to say, like, OK, this is actually a JSON web signature. So you have a lot of different algorithms that are supported, because JWT got created at the time where people thought like crypto agility is pretty cool. We're going to do something, and we can rotate and change algorithm and stuff like that, which now, nowadays, it's like a terrible idea. If you're designing a system, you don't want to be crypto agile, because that's how TLS got done many, many times. Anyway, back to JWT. So they support a lot, so HMAC, RSA, elliptic curve, RSA with, so I told you I'm not a cryptographer, MFG1 padding something. So just like weird RSA, oh, pad RSA with weird padding. But same ID, private public key. So why would you want multiple algorithm? Or why would you just like stick to HMAC? Because HMAC is good, it's fast, and it works. Imagine you have like one client, and you're talking to multiple microservices. Pretty common nowadays. So if you're using an HMAC, every, I need to learn how to use that thing, hey. Every system needs to have the secret to verify the token. Otherwise, we're just going to say, like, OK, I got a token, but I can't verify it because I don't have the secret, and you're signing for nothing. So everyone got their uh, secret. It's good until Silvio comes in and pop one of your systems. Then one of the secrets is compromised. 
But since they're all the same, all your secrets are compromised. So you're back to zero. You don't know which one of your systems got popped. You know that one is because your secret is compromised, but you don't know which one. That's why you probably want to use public and private key. So what you can do is something uh, pretty simple, let's say, to not say stupid, is put the public and the private key everywhere, but you're back to that scenario, so you're not learning, you're not gaining anything security-wise. If you're a bit smarter, what you can do is just having, like, have some microservices or API that are trusted, like your authentication, for example, and only those services can issue tokens because they are the only one with the private key. And everyone else can verify the signature because they got the public key. And if one of the systems gets popped and you're lucky it's not the one with the private key, you don't really care. People have a shell in your, in your network, but at least they didn't get the private key. Uh, so, and the good thing as well is that you can even do that in the browser. So if you need to use a token inside your browser to do, for example, a redirect, you can use, verify the signature in the browser with the public key because it's public. And why aren't anyone, everyone doing that? The problem is that if you're at like a really big scale, RSA or electric curve is a lot more resource intensive and a lot bigger than just HMAC and a lot more complex to deploy. So that's why people tend to keep using HMAC. Sorry. So we did the header, now we're moving to the payload. Um, so basically the payload is base64, JSON of whatever you want to put. You want to put a username, you want to put roles, you want to put anything really, like you can throw anything you want in the payload. Except you have reserved keywords called claims. For example, expiry, so when the token is gonna expire, or issue at when the token was issued. And you got like few of those, uh, for example, the subject, audience, uh, GTI, claim ID, so it's just a unique ID per token. So if you want to do, for example, anti-replay, people use GTI for that, because it's unique per token. Uh, why would people use expiry versus issue at? So imagine you have like a lot of microservices and some of them are like uh, synchronous and you want them to trust the token for two hours. You can use expiry. But then you got this really slow microservice that process like a token every two days. For this one, you can say, okay, use issue at and only trust the token for one week. And so this way you have this balance and you can, because otherwise your uh, async microservices will uh, use the token and they already be expired, so they can't use them. So that's why it makes sense to use a bit of both. So how do you create a token? You take the header, your JSON header, you base64 encode it, you take the payload, you base64 encode it, then you can concatenate with a dot the header and the payload, then you sign the header plus the payload. That's important, you don't just, you could sign only the payload, but you actually sign both. Then you base64 encode the signature and you append the signature with a dot at the end. And you got this three parts, again, header, payload, signature. How do you verify a token? So you split it into three parts, you base64 decode each part, then you pass the JSON of the header and the payload, and then from that you can retrieve the algorithm from the header. Then you can verify the signature. So if you have an attacker mindset, you can tell already that that's a lot of things you're doing that can go wrong before you even verify the signature. So you're like base64 decoding data, you're JSON passing data, then you're retrieving data from that JSON, and then finally you verify the signature. And last step, you verify the claims to make sure, like for example, the token didn't expire. So yeah, that's a lot that can go wrong, and it does. Keep in mind as well that um, multiple systems can issue tokens. Like you can have, like, if you're testing, like um, doing bug bounty or pen testing, it's not because one of the token that got issued but one of the microservices is sane, but they're all gonna be sane. So you need to make sure that every single microservice issuing token issues the right kind of token. 
Uh, and token can be used as well or consumed by multiple systems. So you need to test all this combination of issuer versus uh, verifier slash user. And all these systems can use different libraries, uh, Node, Java, Python, Ruby. So they can have different behavior. And they can also use different versions of the same library. So it's a lot of testing when you want to test JWT. So when you're attacking JWT, the main idea is to bypass, oh, JWS, to be precise, the main idea is to bypass the signature. So for example, you're logged in as test and you want to become admin, so you need to find a way to go around the signature mechanism. It's really cool, actually, with the two screen because people don't look at me. So, sorry. So the first mistake people are making is not verifying the signature. So for example, in JavaScript, you have two uh, methods to verify in the JSON web token, the default, uh, the most used uh, JavaScript library. You have two methods, you have decode and verify. And the decode one just gets the data out, whereas the verify actually checks the signature. And a lot of people make that mistake. They use the wrong one, or they just do like a bit of decode of debugging put the wrong one, and then forget to put back the right one. And it's basically like you have signed token, but you don't verify the signature. So it's just basically you're sending base 64 encoded JSON string. So how do you exploit that? You get a token, you, temp you decode and temper the payload with the payload, and then you send that token back with the new, with the new data inside the payload. And for example, you can go from test to admin in just like two base 64 commands. So as part of the algorithm, I quickly went through like, what was available, and I didn't talk about this one, the non-algorithm. So we have an, an algorithm that say, like, OK, instead of using HMAC, RSA, elliptic curve, blah, 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 just use none. Don't sign the token. And now in 2019, when you look at it, it's like, what were they thinking? But it's actually pretty common, like it was the case in uh, TLS, oh, SSL at the time, at the same time with null cipher. So it's just a way to make things easy to debug. And I think it was like three, four years ago that someone realized that a lot of implementation uh, allowed this, and you could just bypass all the signed token just using the non-algorithm. So what do you do? You get a token, you decode the header and change the algorithm to none, or none, depending on the server-side implementation. Uh, you decode and change the payload. Then you keep or remove the signature, depending on the uh, server-side as well as the library. Sometimes you need to remove the signature. Sometimes you need to keep it. So you need to try a bit of everything. And you're just in. So we're going to try. That's the demo I messed up last time. So I got just a simple website. I'm going to register Silvio. What's your password, Silvio, again? <laughs> Let's say plop. OK, so I'm logged in as Silvio. Now I'm going to get a terminal. OK, people can see that OK. So I'm going to get It's very bright here. I'm going to end up with a tan. So I get my token. I copy it in VI. Oh. I'm going to D. OK, so I didn't lie. It's JWS, algorithm HS256. So I'm going to copy that. I forgot half of it. Uh. Blah, 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 blah. And I got my new header. And yep. And then I'm going to go to the end. And I'm going to keep everything. So I'm not going to modify the payload just yet, because you want to try, when you're doing this kind of thing, you, can, you want to try one thing at a time. Uh, so basically, I'm just doing an HTTP request with curl, because you can't really trust browsers to do the right thing. So I'm currently logged in as Silvio. No one cares because I logged in as Silvio. But as soon as I, and you can see that I removed the signature as well. 
So now the token is not, they are not verifying the integrity of the token. So I'm going to base64 decode the payload. That's a bit better for people, I think. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say, OK, now I want to be admin. Oh, I, I missed one thing. And OK, I'm going to buy. So if you can see here, it's not, it doesn't look really like JSON here, right, after the 44. It's because of the URL safe uh, base64 encoding without padding. If I add the padding, ta da, the curly bracket appear here. Because, yeah, it's like the base64 decoding just eats that part of the data. So I'm going to keep that part. I'm going to get back to my curl. And hopefully, See, you are currently logged in as admin, the key for, yeah. It's kind of CTFE, so you got a key when you solve an exercise, but it's Silvio, Silvio, Silvio. I really like Silvio, <laughs> as you can probably tell already. Uh, so yeah, that's the one I messed up last time. <laughs> Whew. The problem is that it's actually the easiest one. So another one is weak secret. So especially when you're using so you can have weak RSA key, but it's pretty hard to mess up like RSA key generation those days, hopefully. Anyway, so the thing is that the signature of the, the, secret, the security of the signature relies on the strength of the secret. If your secret is like five characters, it's going to be pretty easy to crack it. And you can crack it offline uh, with just one valid token. So the good thing is if you want to attack like an application that you use uh, JWT, you get one token. Then you get that token and you try to crack it for six months with Ashcat. So you made one request, and like legit request, right? Then six months later, you get the secret, and hopefully no one changes it, and you do another request. And you now, instead of being logged in as test, you logged in as admin. And you just made two requests, and they both look legit. Because you don't, you're not brute forcing. You are, you're brute forcing, but offline. You're not attacking the server. And, like sending requests and requesting requests. So it's really hard to detect. So, and basically, as people say, no logs, no crime. <laughs> That's when you can tell that people are from law enforcement in the room. Yeah, you can tell we're in, CB, in, in Canberra, there are more people here. Um, so basically, and it happens a lot. Like, for example, that's just uh, one uh, kind of like framework around like JWT, uh, REST API Express. And that's how they set the um, their JWT. They just say, like, OK, if we are in production, we're going to use uh, the environment variable JWT underscore secret. If we are not in production mode, we're just going to use secret. And yeah, that's probably a terrible idea, because someone makes a typo and just type like production instead of production, and you're in a lot of trouble. So yeah, you really want to use strong secret for that. So, Exploitation, you get a token, you brute force the secret offline until you get the same signature. And then once you get this uh, HMAC to sign the secret, you can just create whatever uh, JWT you want. You just sign the uh, payload and send that to the application, and you're in. Now we're going to go to the funny stuff. Algorithm confusion. So the algorithm, oh, the sender controls the algorithm used. So when I create a JWT and I send it to like uh, an application, uh, me as a malicious person, uh, I'm going to pick what algorithm is used because I'm creating the JWT, right? So I can say like, okay, I'm going to use none. In the application, you say like, Louis, it's not 2018 anymore. None is not supported anymore. So you need to do better than that. And if the application uses HMARC, for example, um, they're going to check my token using the secret. If they're using RSA, they're going to check my, to my check my token using the public key, because you verify with the public key. Now, if you try to look at the source code of this verification, of this check, it's going to say, OK, get the algorithm and verify with the public key. Thinking get the algorithm is going to return RSA. But what happens if? get the algorithm return HMAC. The application will say, like, OK, 
I'm going to verify the token, the signature, with the public key using HMAC. And the public key is public, so you can potentially get it. So basically, going to sign a token with the public key and manage to get through. So you tell, basically, you create a token, you tell the receiver, it's an HMAC, not an RSA this time, not RSA to RS256 this time. And since in the source code of the server application, there is like, verify the token with a private key, thinking it's a RSA. But you're sending, this is actually HMAC, you can get through. So how to get the public key? So that's probably the hardest part. Um, it may be available in JavaScript. Uh, it may be publicly available, for example, in a mobile client. You just reverse the mobile client because they may need to verify tokens, so they just they can get the public key. Or maybe in the documentation as well, a few good places to get it. Anyway, we get the public key. What we're going to do is we get a token signed with RSA, and we have access to the public key. We're going to decode the header and change the algorithm to RS256, and then we're going to tamper with the payload, and we're going to sign the token with HMAC and the public key. So I got another web app. So you trust me, I can register and log in, but I think the interesting part is not here. So I got my token. I just removed the signature because I don't care about that part, and I got my public key. So just do two simple things. So oh, one really important thing is I don't copy paste the public key. I just like read the file, so I don't make any like changes with new lines and things like that. And I say like, okay, I'm gonna say set the algorithm from RSA to HMAC because I'm changing RS256 to HS256. Then I'm gonna change my username from test to admin, and then what I'm going to do is just do an HMAC of the data, so my uh, new header and my new payload, and I'm going to sign that with the public key. So if I, I get that value, I remove the records just in case. So again, using curl because hacking has to be visual. visual. Localhost, 81, uh, I think. Yeah. And you are currently logged in as admin. And the key is Kylie, Kylie, Kylie. See? OK. So again, um, as someone we really enjoy like applied crypto, I find that a really, really cool uh, bug. Because it's like, you don't need to be like hardcore in crypto to understand like what the problem is and why it works and how fun it is. Now, um, again, with JWT, people like to be crypto agile. So someone had this great idea to say like, oh, instead of hard coding the key, we're going to use key ID so we can support multiple keys. Um, so basically, it's a header. In, so it's an attribute in the header of the, pay, of the JWT that says, like, OK, you can retrieve that key from, for example, it's just a string. So you can use that as a path on the file system. You can use that as a string to match uh, in a database. And the good thing is that since you need the key to verify the token, you're going to do, you're going to, if potentially this key ID is injectable, you can probably potentially exploit a bug in that retrieval of the key to bypass the authentication, or even get a shell. So we get a signed token containing a key ID parameter. We decode the header and change the key ID, for example, to an SQL injection payload. We tamper with the payload. And what we're going to do is, instead of using the SQL injection to retrieve data from the database, because that's pretty boring and everyone is doing that, we're going to use the SQL injection to return a value that is predictable, and that is going to be used to sign the token. Uh, so again, uh, so 
So that's even simpler. Uh, hmm, okay. But I had syntax highlight me. Anyway, so here the idea is okay, we got an RS, uh, HMAC token, and we just sign it with the value AAA. And why are we using AAA? Because that's going to be the return value of OSQL injection. So what is happening is the application gets the token, pass the header, get the key ID, use that key ID to retrieve the key to verify the token. But as part of getting that key, we do an SQL injection, and we say, like, OK, we're going to return AAAA. And since that's going to be used as the key to verify the token, we're going to sign the token with exactly the same key. Again, we get a token. So this time I did not remove all the equals. But, uh, OK. Uh, yeah. And yeah, we are currently logged in as admin because we put a username as admin, and the key is against Silvio because I'm someone with a lot of inspiration in life. Um, yeah. Play slideshow. So just basically, yeah, since we have an SQL injection, we can use that to predict, to force the application to use OK instead of the one that was in the database. Uh, yep. So CVE 2018 So um, as part of the sign token, you can put in the header a key. You say, like, oh, this is uh, a JWS uh, token. This is signed using HMAC, or this is signed using RSA. And this is a key that has been used to sign the token. And obviously, if you're a server, you shouldn't really trust that key, because it's like, oh, I signed that token with that key, so I'm giving you everything, and you can use that to check that I really signed it with that key. So it's like you put the key inside the envelope, and we open the envelope and say, like, OK, oh, that's the key that signed the envelope. That's perfect. And yeah, basically, it's, yeah. And it was, but if you look at source code that is pretty complex and they've got like a lot of layer of abstraction, you can see how that can happen. And that happened to Cisco in uh, their JavaScript library. So basically, you, if they trust embedded JWK um, in the header. And the good thing is that if you were using that library, and never used JWK in your life, you were still vulnerable to that, because that's by default in the library. So what you do, you get a token, you decode and tamper with the payload, you generate a RSA key to sign your token, because you're going to use RSA, and you add the exponent and the modulus to the header, and use uh, RS256, and you sign the token, because you got the private key. And you say, like, OK, I send the token with that private key and check it with the public key that is in the same token. Um, don't freeze on me. Oh, no, come on. Not again. Come on. Ugh. I'm surprisingly unlucky in life. Ugh. Anyway, last time I managed to recover. No, that's going to be the same thing as last time. Uh, oh, that's working this time. My seat's. Oh, fuck. Sorry. <laughs> People are going to start believing that I do that on purpose to save time. I, sh I swear I got m enough content to finish. So, OK, so I'm going to do that demo later. Next thing, where is my computer starting? I'm going to unplug it while it starts, because I may have something. So when I start looking at uh, JWT and JWS like a few years back, I read the RFC. I don't know. Like, everyone know what the RFC is? Basically, like, people putting together rules to say, like, uh, uh, to say, like, OK, that's how things should work when you're using TLS, when you're using SSL, when you're using HTTP, things like that. So 
what uh, I found in the RFC was these two parameters named JKU and X5U. And basically, yeah, I know that it shut down because of a problem. Like, I'm well aware of that. I was there. So, and basically, I thought, like, oh, this is amazing. It's just a way to say, like, oh, to the application, go fetch the key from that web server. Oh, it should be all right. It happened before, so got to deal with it. Um, so the real problem is that Docker takes, like, hours to start. But we should still be good. Uh, if I can find the file. Yeah. So basically, I read that. And I was like, oh, my god, this is amazing. They get like, the application to fetch a JWK. There's going to be so many bugs in that. Like three, four years, or maybe not three, four, but two, three years at least. And at the time, no one was using it. And I was really disappointing, disappointed. Uh, I really need to get a new laptop. Um, OK. This time it's, so yeah. And so JKU is just short for JWK set URL. And recently I looked again at it, and people start using it. And I was like, yay. So basically, the idea is you got a user application and trusted server. And you send an HTTP request as a user, and the application, I'm going to get this thing if it works. Yeah. Um, get the JWT, pass the header, or decode it, pass the header, get the JKU, then fetch the JWK, so the key used to verify the signature, from a trusted server or from itself. And then it says, like, okay, it passes the JWK, and then it verifies the signature using the JWK, and it sends back a, a response to the user. So if you do like a, a bit of pen testing and a bit of bug bounty, you can see like a lot can go wrong here. Like in this number three, like, oh, so much fun. Um, so the HTTP, uh, so as an attacker, you send an HTTP request with a malicious JWT. So that's, a, that's easy mode. Uh, so it's going to pass the JKU, and you're going to say like, oh, instead of going to your trusted server, you should go to my malicious server. A lot better, better keys, better quality, get this, not miss out. And the server is going to get your malicious JW key, and it's going to pass it and verify the token you sent with your own malicious key. And for people who are uh, into that, you can see as well that you probably got like a server-side request forgery inside the network of the application. So that's fun. But thankfully, most people prevent that. They say like, OK, they should only be, uh, you should only trust some server or some website, not everyone on the internet. So they block that just simple attack. Um, there is a really fun JavaScript implementation that fetch it, but tell you, like, OK, um, the signature is valid. I fetch the token, but I don't trust these people. So you still can do like server side request for joy inside the network and do whatever you want, but uh, um, but they tell you like it's not trust, it's valid, but it's not trusted. But it turns out filtering URL is incredibly hard, and people mess it up all the time. So uh, yeah, we're good. Um, first, people using regular expression, they forget to escape the dots. So trusted example, trusted.example.com, you can find a bypass by just buying the domain, uh, domain trusted Z or trusted ABCD, whatever you want, example.com. And that's how you can easily bypass this simple irregular expression. So another thing is um, uh, people are using starts with. And on paper, starts with looks really good. You say, like, oh, I want the URL to start with trusted, because I trust these people. But if you forget the slash at the end, what you can do is like HTTPS uh, trusted at pentestalab.com. And that's going to go to pentestalab. That's not going to go to trusted, because it's going to be like the um, HTTP client will think that, oh, that's a username to fetch uh, that data from pentestalab.com. So that's pretty common like with server-side request forgery. Another one is to say, like, OK, JWK slash JWKS dot dot slash and the file you uploaded. And since you uploaded the key, you can just bypass it that way. Or you can find an open redirect, or even better, a header injection. I'm going to get back to header injection, because that's going to be really fun. 
So we go back to like one, two, three. We're fetching the key based on the JKU header. But this time we got an open redirect. And we're going to use the open redirect to say, OK, actually, instead of fetching the key from the trusted, oh, trust, the trusted server is going to return a redirect to the malicious server. And the application will fetch the malicious JWK from the malicious server thanks to the redirect. And then it's going to use that malicious JWK to verify the token. And since you control the token and the, signature, and the key to sign the token, you're in. Um, then, even more fun. So you know like how like, when you do like pen tests and you run burp and they find a new header injection, you're like, oh man, find a header injection, I'm gonna have to report it, and then it's gonna look lame, I'm gonna have a low in my report, and people are gonna laugh at me, that's gonna be terrible. We're gonna make header injection great again. <laughs> uh, so imagine you have like fetching of a JWK based on the JKU header. And this time you can't go at all, at all to your malicious server because they got like huge firewall. Nothing can get out, blah, blah, blah. And you're lucky you got a header injection. I'm gonna check quickly if, um, yeah, it looks like Docker is started. Woohoo! We are back in business. Yeah, if you do demo, it's always good to have a way to restart everything. So, you got the header injection. So that's when it gets really tricky. What you're gonna do is, you're gonna exploit the header injection in your JKU. So you're gonna use the header injection to return a full body with the key. And the application is gonna use that key because it comes from the trusted server, because the URL starts with the trusted server. And it's gonna use that key to verify the token. And you're in. Um, I'm gonna jump to this. Uh, okay. Uh, CV 218.0. So we, I'm gonna quickly go back to the previous one to show that I can solve all of them. So basically, for the previous one, the one with the not Jose, like Cisco not Jose bug, you just basically, you put inside the header a JWK with, uh, so it's used for signature, and you put N and E, which are the public, uh, the exponent and the modulus, or the modulus and the exponent of your public key, and you sign with the private key, and you send that to the server, and you're gonna get in. But this time, uh, So we have a simple script. So here we're just generating like a JWK. Same way as before, we just like create, we have a private key and we just say like, okay, we get the public key, we put that in some JSON. And that's where the cool thing happened. So here, slash debug is, uh, maybe I went a bit too far. Slash debug is your header injection. So it's just gonna basic way to inject in the header. But what we're gonna do is inject in the header, and we're gonna inject, um, so the end of line to go to the next header. When we're gonna, then we're gonna inject like a content length to like create a real response, something that looks like a, a normal HTTP response coming from the trusted server, which here is the same system and we're gonna inject everything, and then we're gonna sign exactly with the same key. So if we run that, we can see like, oh, that's RSA key. When I said they were bigger than the H mark, I didn't lie, like that's, uh, that's one key, so a lot bigger. So here, the first part, which you probably can barely see, is the header injection, but exploited in a way, so you can see like I'm adding like, uh, return, end of line, then the content length, and then I'm adding like all the JSON. So I'm just ex ex using the header injection to create the response I want with the right JWK. Then I'm gonna put all of this in the header as part of the JKU. I hope no one got a headache from all of this thing. 
and I'm just going to say, OK. So this is really big token, because you can imagine that you got like the full JWK embedded in the JKU, embedded in the header, base64 encoded, and then it's signed with RSA. And basically, we become admin. And yeah, and the key is Silvio Silvio. So basically, we're using the header injection to just create the right key. And since the header, since the response comes from the same server, we bypass any restriction that may be in place around like firewalling or URL starting with the right value and things like that. Um, another thing is, as part of the RFC, they call out, they call out that you should avoid man in the middle. And to do that, you need to use HTTPS instead of HTTP. Because otherwise, if you're malicious, you just say like, OK, um, fetch that key. And if you can man in the middle of the application, and you man in the middle and respond with another key. Um, so the problem is that people don't, oh, some implement, few implementation get it wrong and, try, and check that the URL starts with HTTPS when they uh, create the token, which is good, but you don't actually care. What you need to check is when you retrieve the key. Over, because again, the person providing the JKU is the attacker or someone you can't trust, and they have control over that value. So you should enforce TLS when you fetch the key, not when you create the token. OK, conclusion. So use strong secrets and key, because that's like the strength of your uh, security relies on the strength of that key. Uh, don't store them in your source code. That's pretty common, but like if you have everything in your source code and one day one developer leaves, you need to rotate the key or he got the key, so it's pretty bad posture. Uh, make sure you have key rotation built in. It's really hard to bake key rotation after you got an incident or when you need to do it like uh, as when you, yeah, yeah, you're really like in the middle of an incident to try to get it um, built in from day one. Uh, review the library you key, you pick, because um, it's not because you're using just HMAC that the library you're using may not be vulnerable to other things, like the attacks we saw before. Uh, make sure you check the signature, because you will be surprised, like, yeah. When I did that talk last time, people were like, oh, OK. Uh, actually, we just looked at the source code, and there was one of the services that was using uh, decode instead of verify. Like, they just check after the talk. Uh, make sure your tokens expire, because if you sign tokens and they never expire, they're going to be valid forever. So your only solution is to rotate the key. So you want really to have expiry inside your token. Um, enforce the algorithm. So don't let the client say, like, OK, you're going to use HMAC today. You're going to use RSA today. Just write in code that, OK, this has to be verified using HMAC, because that's HMAC we're using. Um, JWT are very complex and kind of insecure by design. Like people working in security and especially crypto hate JWT. Um, people can use Pazetto, which is a lot less crypto agile and a lot more secure by design because it's less permissive. Um, JWT library introduced very, very interesting bugs. So make sure you check for them if you do like code review, uh, pen test, bug bounty, or any security testing already because, yeah, you're going to find stuff. And thanks for your time. And if you have any questions. Thanks, Matt. Well, we, uh, folks, do we have any questions at all? Questions? Yep, there's just one up the back there. Mic runners. Anyone else for questions? Bueller? All right, uh, they, thank you for that. It was uh, super interesting and some really good points about checking keys and so on um, when verifying JOTs. One of the things that we used to see quite a lot is that when people would um, verify JOTs, particularly things like ID tokens that might have been issued by another service, they would get past all of these and do all these bits right, and they'd, they'd get so excited at the end that they'd forget to actually check that the token was intended for them. Yeah. And so I think that's... Yeah, something that it's a real gotcha when you're using another service is make sure that it's actually been issued for yours and not for someone else's service. Yeah, and especially when you're using like OAuth and the scope and stuff like that when you need, yeah. Good point. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you. Do we have any other questions at all? All right. Fantastic okay. talk. Thanks, Louis. Okay. Uh, Let's give him a hand. Yeah.